Even in the middle of nature, it's impossible to escape. In the heart of the Massif of the Vosges, at an altitude of 1,000 meters, is the White Lake Road. A small paradise for lovers of wide open spaces like Christophe Bergamini. If this man from Alsace is a bit tongue-tied that day, it's because of this big football-shaped green ball that he carries on his back. A not-so-discreet accessory, which regularly unbalances him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This futuristic backpack weighs almost 20 kilos. What doesn't help is that with this on your shoulders, there's no way to take a break and breathe a little. Alors nous, on doit pas s'arrêter. Faut marcher tout le temps de la même façon, et puis c'est bon. Essayez de pas s'accrocher aux branches. Precautions are necessary because while a hiker walks, this green ball photographs absolutely everything around him. En fait, c'est deux appareils photo qui me permettent de prendre à 360 degrés le paysage. Donc on va jusqu'au lac, jusqu'au bout là-bas et, et de l'autre côté. C'est juste des images qui sont prises tous les, toutes les deux, trois secondes euh, au fur et à mesure où j'avance. In the end, here is the result. Panoramic photos visible on the internet, which allow you to look up. Left. Right and even to move in a virtual landscape while staying in the comfort of your home. For Christophe Bergamini, who runs the local tourist office, a good advertisement for the region. For Google, which invented the machine, this is a wild ambition. To digitize the whole world, pixel by pixel. A global campaign orchestrated 10,000 kilometers away from California, near San Francisco, at the headquarters of the giant who wants to take over the world, and which, however, from close up presents itself under a most likable aspect. Just like Luc Vincent, the French engineer who is leading this pilot project, called Street View. Hey guys, morning. The father of the backpack with all the cameras is him. But his most famous invention is this car that doesn't go unnoticed. Donc voilà le, le street view, le street view car. On the roof of the car, the same device as that of the Alsatian hiker, but off course with many more miles on the odometer. On a fait dans les 3000 villes, je dirais, des milliers de villes, de pays, on en a 64 qui sont, qui sont couverts. On a fait en gros 10 millions de kilomètres. It is the photos taken by these cars that make it possible to see a street. As if you were there and you're looking for an address to find in real life, but it's online. Since the first invention, the engineer has expanded. À un moment, on s'est dit quand même que se limiter aux rues, c'était un problème. On a créé cette, cette motoneige. Motoneige Street View, en fait, c'est très très simple en fait. Ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a pris l'équipement de Street View, on a juste mis sur une grosse motoneige. A snowmobile to map the ski trails. A rolling desk to enter museums. A tricycle for pedestrian zones. Then the famous backpack for the hikes. With all these devices, the whole planet will soon probably be on this search engine. There are already a lot of things from the pyramids of Cairo to the lost islands of the Pacific Ocean. Passing through Venice, lots of the mythical and inaccessible places on Earth, even the underwater worlds, are now within the reach of a mouse click. Luck Vincent doesn't hold back. When I give a presentation on Street View, I like to terminate on a montage photo that shows a montage, that shows a Street View on the Moon. Mais euh, non, pas encore de plan précis. <rire> Mais c'est pas impossible Rien n'est impossible à Google, je dirais. Ah, ouais. 
He is not joking here because the appetite of Google doesn't have limits. Much larger than everything you could imagine and you thought you knew about this search engine. Google for all of us is about that. Six colored letters that have become a daily reflex. Almost like a drug. Every day, more than 3 billion searches are made on this website. We always have a question to ask it, and it is used everywhere by many people. At work. At home, at the slightest disturbing sight of a symptom, or at dinners with friends to settle a debate that could have lasted for hours. 83. By becoming the answer to all our questions, in just 17 years, Google has become the most powerful brand in the world before Coca-Cola and McDonald's. A dazzling success that has made the fortune of its two founders. Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the current CEO. Two visionaries, both 42 years old each with an estimated fortune of $30 billion and their ambitions remain as excessive and big as it has always been. Companies are doing the same incremental thing that they did 50 years ago or 20 years ago. That's not really what we need. We need, especially in technology, we need revolutionary change. With them, the startup from the beginning has become widespread. Besides the search engine, Google also has the Gmail mailbox the YouTube video site, and the internet browser Google Chrome, or Android, which runs most smartphones in the world. Nevertheless, the giant is always looking ahead. Google introduces its new self-driving car prototype. With its incredible projects of self-driving cars, or a possible pill to detect cancer. The company is in the process of inventing our future. What do we know about this company with the reassuring logo that is so present in our lives? Welcome to the garage. This normally secretive multinational company agreed to open its doors for us and to give us the secrets to its incredible success story. We shoot big, we shoot for the moon, like 10x, so even if it might not be like physically uh, feasible at the moment. A company that relies on creativity and the well-being of its employees and which says to act for the wellness of humanity. My job description is to enlighten minds, open hearts, create world peace. Don't be evil. C'était le slogan dès le départ de Google en fait et ça veut dire faire la chose la meilleure possible. Beyond this very smooth image, you will discover a much more disturbing reality. Within a few years, without you realizing it, Google has become a huge personal data vacuum cleaner. No company in the world knows so much about you and benefit as much from it. It has a business model that just keeps minting money through ads. Once you start to see that we're a product, that explains a lot about what Google is doing. Its power is crushing more and more companies. Is it normal, is it moral, that one single actor can organize the commerce mondial? It also poses a threat to citizens and states. We live in another world, in another universe. The company dreams of changing our lives, but at what cost exactly? David Coase and his wife have lived through several revolutions together. First, there was the birth of their son, Antoine, and in the following, the move to California. He was the least impacted. He didn't see much of the chaos. After three days, he got used to it. He drank the bottles. It is us that this made a change. For the past few months, this 30-year-old French engineer has been living the Google dream. After three years in the company's Parisian offices, he ended up joining the headquarters in Silicon Valley, the largest concentration of high-tech companies in the world. This is where you can find Apple's headquarters. 
Facebook, Yahoo, and the most iconic of all, the famous Googleplex. This is the center of the Googleplex, with the buses, the people who arrive in the morning. A huge American-style campus, spread over 30 buildings. Despite its size and its 15,000 employees from all over the world, the place still cultivates the spirit of all Californian startups with its free cafeterias. The gyms which open 24 hours a day and the self-service bicycles in the brand's colors. The company even plays the well-being card. Welcome to the meditation room. With its meditation guru who gives courses to employees. In this atmosphere worthy of an amusement park, the Frenchman quickly became familiar with it. In the morning, he always starts his day with a breakfast in the micro kitchen, translated as mini cuisine in French. There are several in each building, and they are very well despite their name. On va trouver uh, toutes sortes de, de, de boissons énergisantes, de soda. Il y a des thés frais, par exemple. Uh, sinon, on a ce, des choses uh, que j'aime bien aussi, c'est cette boisson pétillante avec l'orange et de la mangue. Puis sinon, il y a des trucs plus classiques, uh, Coca. Il uh. y a aussi donc les, des, toutes sortes de céréales ici dans des, dans des, dans des vases. Et puis là, sinon, il y, y a des fruits. Uh, des barres de céréales, ici dans les tiroirs. An enormous choice. Uh, là, il y a des chips. All is free for the employees. On dit souvent que les gens prennent 10 pounds, donc 5 kilos, uh, quand, ils, quand ils arrivent à travailler, quand ils travaillent à Google, quand ils commencent, et uh, qu'ils ont du mal à les perdre ensuite, parce que là, c'est des habitudes. <laughs> the free food is one of the many advantages here, as well as very generous salaries. According to our information, on average, 10,000 euros per month for an engineer. Only at that price, Google wants creative people. That's what made David stand out in their eyes. I have got with me here David Koch. He's a software engineer at the Google Platform Institute in Paris. Go on a year ago, the Frenchman created the buzz at the annual Google event. Thanks to this little cardboard box. Oh, that's great. Oh, dang. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. Oh my God. These glasses, which don't look like much, are in fact a little gem of technology invented by the engineer. With a smartphone, the software he designed take these simple photos and then recreate a universe with three dimensions. Là, je suis dans une salle à Versailles. Euh, je vois la, la salle du, le, je vois une table à, à, de repas et si je tourne ma tête, je vais voir euh, la peinture de euh, Marie-Antoinette comme si j'étais vraiment euh, dans l'endroit en question. Et ce qui se passe en fait, c'est que en faisant ça, les deux images qu'on voyait séparées euh, à l'écran sur le téléphone, grâce aux deux lentilles qu'on voit ici, en fait, vont converger euh, et être interprétées par le cerveau comme euh, comme euh, des images qu'on qu voit dans la réalité, euh, euh, comme je vois actuellement. The innovation is the key word here, an obsession that has been in Google's history. Since its creation, exactly 17 years ago, by two visionary students from different backgrounds, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Both were born in 1973 in an era when computers looked like this, and where having internet access at home was a subject of science fiction. Larry Page, the more introverted one, grew up in Michigan, in the northeastern United States to a family of professors. He dreamed of becoming an inventor. Sergey Brin, on the other hand, comes from much further away, from Moscow. His parents, Two Jewish scientists decided to flee from anti-Semitism from communist Russia to settle in Maryland in 1979. It was around the age of 20 that these two computer enthusiasts met on the benches at the Stanford University. They wanted to get their doctorate, but they revolutionized the internet while doing that.
Like many other success stories in Silicon Valley, it is in this setting of American Teenage series that the story of Google begins. An epic that this teacher still remembers perfectly. This is my office and you can tell, uh, I'll show you if, if, if Michael's here. So just look around at the flavor of the office and then let me show you my young colleague. Notice a difference? <laughs> Hi Michael. So I have all the books and the young people do everything online. Terry Winograd may play at old school, but he trained a whole generation of small geniuses of the net, like Larry Page. Just for reference, I don't know if you want to know later, this, is, this was Larry's office. He witnessed firsthand the beginning of Google. You have the famous desk. Oh, uh, no pressure, right? <laughs> so this was Larry Page's desk? Yeah, that was, that was it, and, and the first servers were under that desk. The professor supervises Larry Page's work and soon notices his obsession for futuristic inventions. I remember one of the things he was talking about was space tethers, right? That you could build a thing that you could, there's still people working on this, right? You could actually send cargo up to space on a, a line. So that's the kind of idea you don't normally expect a computer science student to be working on. But he wasn't really working on it, he was speculating, right? He liked to speculate. His thesis project is less far-fetched. The student wants to improve the way to search for information on the internet, like Sergey Brin. The two students then decide to come on board together for an adventure that will take them much further than they could have ever expected. They already need a lot of hard drives to archive all the internet content and build a kind of a huge digital library which contains all the information on the web. Ah, there it is. The first records they use are still kept by the university as if they were museum pieces. They needed a rack to mount the disk drives and they decided they could just build their own rack using Legos because they were solid enough to, to support them. And you know, part of the fun of, you know, so they built this rack. I don't think it had that thing on top with the people originally. I think that was added to give it more color. Very quickly, these disks became no longer sufficient. In the end, the, the capacity wasn't appropriate for doing any university. That's when they went off and started a separate company, is when they said, we need to scale up, and to scale up, we need money. To get money, we need a company, and so then they went off and, and did the company. They then decide to drop their studies and draw a line under their academic careers at the university. They feel like I should have a PhD, but it wasn't worth staying here when they could have gone off and done what they did. They are already so sure of themselves at the time that they choose for their company a name to match their ambitions. Google. A distortion of the Mathematica term Gogol, a one followed by a hundred zeros. A huge number to symbolize the millions of internet pages that they want to link. It is 1998, and nobody suspects a thing but then that this search engine with a silly name will sweep away all the others. To this tornado, a Frenchman living in Silicon Valley was among the first witnesses. In the late 90s, a few months before the creation of the famous Google, Louis Monier, who arrived in the United States 20 years before, was considered as a small internet phenomenon. <sighs> Ça c'était, je dirais, le, le, le summum de l'intérêt. Il y avait Fortune magazine qui voulait, qui voulait m'interviewer. Vous étiez une star du web à l'époque. Un peu, oui. Mais ça m'est pas monté à la tête. <laughs> if the press was interested in him, it is because he is the inventor of a very popular search engine then, AltaVista. C'était une copie de la page de garde Alta Vista au tout début. In those years, almost the prehistory of the internet, no search engine has imposed itself. There's Yahoo and many sites that have disappeared since. Hotbot, InfoSeek, Excite, or Lycos, which some of you may remember. A competitive world 
where Alta Vista starts to make a name for itself. La plupart des moteurs de recherche répondaient peut-être en 10 secondes, 30 secondes, la plupart du temps ça ne marchait pas, enfin il n'y avait pas le volume, il n'y avait pas ce qu'il fallait pour, pour répondre au volume, de, aux besoins. Et Alta Vista, on répondait en une fraction de seconde, ce que les gens pensaient était absolument magique. Alta Vista responds faster, but in substance, it works like any other search engines. The principle is simple. To find the best website according to a request, how it works is, an engine will search the content of the pages. If you type Madonna, for example, the engine will search for sites where the word Madonna appears. The site where it finds looks at the words the most times. More words is considered as the best. It therefore comes first in the answers. The problem is that to get to the top, the websites will succeed to hijack the system. Ça reposait uniquement sur ce qui était dans la page. Ce qui veut dire que si quelqu'un avait de mauvaises intentions, il pouvait facilement tricher. Et c'est ce qui s'est passé. Au bout de quelques mois, au bout d'un an, euh, bon bah, il y a eu ce qu'on appelait le spam. Donc les, les gens créaient des pages qui n'avaient aucune valeur, mais dont le seul but était d'attirer les moteurs de recherche et de tirer du trafic vers là pour montrer des publicités. Users wanted a more efficient search engine. And it was Larry Page who brought them the solution they asked. Thanks to an intuition that has turned the internet upside down. While working on his thesis, the student thinks that a search engine cannot rely solely on the contents of a website. It must also be able to measure its reputation. To do this, Larry Page decided to rely on links from one site to another, exactly as the recommendations. L'idée était de faire confiance à une page si d'autres pages ont un lien vers cette page. Mais essentiellement, c'est ça. C'est de dire, s'il y a suffisamment de gens qui réellement trouvent une page pertinente, ça la rend plus pertinente. When a site about Madonna, for example, is referenced thousands of times, it means that many people found the information on the website useful. If it is cited by only three sites, it has not impressed anyone, even if the word Madonna is more often mentioned. Therefore, to find the best websites, Larry Page eventually decided to count the links. It sounds simple, but in the vastness of the internet, it is a brain teaser, a highly complex mathematical problem that the student ends up solving with a formula, which we call now an algorithm, a series of symbols that are incomprehensible for non-specialists, but that will make the site crash. One year after its launch in 1999, 3 million searches were typed each day on the search engine. Today, this number is at over 3 billion. A phenomenal success, which is still based on mathematical formulas that the company insists on keeping confidential. At the headquarters of Google, behind the children's decorations and the very relaxed atmosphere that the company likes to promote, Distrust is required. For Google employees, it's second nature. Everybody has to have a badge you can not Yes. Enter. Yes, you do have to have a badge. Why? Um, it's uh, uh, I'm just basically basic security. Don't let his shy student look fool you. At 48 years old, Ben Gomes is an authority here. He is the one who watches over the famous algorithm, a more secret formula than that of Coca-Cola. The access to the office, with its too sensitive data, is forbidden to us. It is thus in this stripped meeting room that the interview will take place. The reason we can't be open about the algorithm is unfortunately, some of the things we're trying to do is say, this site is more useful to users, more important to users than this other site. And there are very signals we use in algorithm to do that. Now, the, unfortunately, there are bad actors who, not most, most people who put up, but there are bad actors who want to get traffic to their site, regardless of whether they are the most relevant or not. Today, Google is no longer just a single algorithm. It consists about 200 mathematical formulas that change several times a day to prevent research results from being distorted. 
a job that mobilizes nearly 15,000 engineers of the company's 55,000 employees worldwide. It is also necessary to permanently make the search engine more powerful and easier to use. In voice version, for example, on a smartphone. Who is the Prime Minister of France? Manuel Valls is the Prime Minister of France. And we can even begin to ask follow-up questions. Where was he born? He was born in Barcelona, Spain. I, I, I didn't know that. It understood where was, where was he born, right? We, we, I didn't have to say where was that uh, uh, Manuel Valls born, I, I just say where was he born. That's how I would talk to a human being. So we're trying to make search a much more natural interaction from just typing. Because that's when, people, when you start talking, you talk as you would to another person, right? So you tend to talk in natural language. Faced with this kind of technological prowess, difficult to imagine the company's early amateur days. If Larry Page and Sergey Brin are inventors who know how to work together, at the start of this adventure, they weren't exactly born as business savvies. With his old fleece and his unkempt beard, how does one imagine that this man is one of the richest people in the world? David Sherrington is a professor at Stanford. In the late 90s, when Larry and Sergey launched their search engine on campus, he was on the front row seat. I actually heard about it first from some other, another faculty member. Uh, I was very impressed because at the time, this would have been 1997, I think, there was, uh, the internet was growing tremendously and yet uh, search was getting worse. I entered the uh, Canadian exchange rate and it found, immediately found an I'm feeling lucky site that was the best place to find about everything I ever wanted to know about the Canadian exchange rate at the time. The instructor, with money to invest thanks to a company that he sold a year earlier, is requested by the two students. Oh, here it is. Yeah, this one matches. Okay. They have just Sorry. given up their thesis to settle here, in the garage of this tiny house. David Sherrington, who believes in the project, signs a check for $200,000. Okay, so now we got the right place. Soon enough, his investment worries him. Yep. He finds the entrepreneurs too dispersed. Uh, both Larry and Sergey did a number of things that uh, worried me a little bit along the way. You know, uh, they, uh, well, this place, you know, seemed a little unprofessional. Uh, Larry in particular had all these interesting ideas about, even back then, about autonomous vehicles and ways of doing delivery and things. And I said, well, how about if you do this company first? <laughs> With the investments that they get, Larry and Sergi buy equipment and start hiring. They earn nothing but spend without counting the cost and want to continue have fun as students. One year after the creation of their company, they have already left the garage for a larger place. This video, shot on the day of the weekly meeting, it gives a small idea of the inner spirit that reigns on board the startup. I always noticed he would periodically pass by my office, sort of, and have this beaming look toward me. And I always took this as a sign of affection. Yeah. <laughs> Until one day I realized he wasn't really looking at me. He was looking at my throne. Oh. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I decided that Larry, being CEO and all, deserved his own throne. A chair for Larry Page. As for the investors, they have to prepare. Advertising t-shirts for Google. The, this is getting to be 15 or 16 years old now, but this is the original Google t-shirt that I got. And uh, one of the first things they did with my money, and people told me that my, my investment was, gonna, was foolish, and so I would tell them that this t-shirt was my $200,000 t-shirt. $200,000 turned into uh, several billion dollars, so it uh, was a significant return. <laughs> Today, his assets are estimated at 3 billion euros. 
a fortune he owes to Google. A few years after inventing the long-awaited search engine, the founders Larry and Sergi has finally figured out how to make the most money out of their invention. While on the surface, everything is free when you use it. To decode the secret of this incredible success, at the headquarters of Fortune magazine. Hi, welcome. Hello, me. One of the most renowned business magazines across the Atlantic. So every year, Fortune ranks the 500 uh, biggest companies in the United States by revenue. And um, Google ranks um, right here at 46, I believe. Google only comes in at 46th place, but if we compare the profits, the company ranks 17th. This is a sign of incredible profitability. Google is a very, very profitable company. It has a business model that just keeps minting money through ads uh, without, you know, they don't have inventory like a retailer has to own things and sell them and has distribution centers and factories and Google does have some infrastructure but mostly the model is bits being delivered over the web and that's uh, very cost efficient. The key to this profitability is advertising. 90% of the company's income, more than $50 billion a year. Google is now the highest earning company in the world thanks to advertising. Pretty ironic for a company that didn't want to do it. At the beginning, Larry and Sergey believed that anything that had advertising would be compromised. They, they believed in providing the best results for their users and they didn't think there was a way to mix that with advertising because all of a sudden then your advertiser would be asking for preferred placement and things like that. And they, they, they vowed that they would never do that. At the time, in the late 90s, internet advertising looked like this picture. And they had very aggressive banners with no link to the content of the websites. This has changed everything and convert the founders of Google. But it was an idea they have stolen from someone else. It was invented by a company in Southern California called Overture, which was later acquired by Yahoo. And they use keywords, the keywords in your search, to put ads next to the search results and clearly show them as, as search ads. Google took that system and made it much better. And, and that was the root of its financial success, which was phenomenal. The principle makes sense. It all starts with the observation that when you do a search, what we write sometimes says a lot about what we would like to buy. If I type Caro, for example, maybe that means I'm planning to go. This may be of interest to a company that sells airline tickets or hotel rooms in Egypt. So the words that you type have commercial value, especially for all those e-commerce sites that make money only with their sale on the internet. So how does Google manage to make billions of money with simple words? North of Paris, in an industrial suburb away from the skyscrapers of San Francisco, with a visit to Cyril Andrino, we will find the answers. This 30-year-old is not Larry Page or Sergi Brin, but his success remains very honorable. Bonjour. He is the head of Brandali, a website that sells fashion items, for example, shoes or dresses which are stored right here. Mesdames, bonne journée. At the beginning of the year, in the warehouse, there is one product that is very famous. Ah, voilà. bon exemple. Brown leather boots, or camel, as they say in fashion industry. Voilà. It's a spirit plus bottine légère, assez féminin. Là, on est sur le côté très fashion. Encore de la bottine marron dans un tout autre style. This year, they are trendy. 
So, Cyrilandrino bought hundreds of pairs of them of all shapes and all styles. He will have to sell them just by going through the internet. Saddles. He relies a lot on Lawrence from the marketing department, but definitely also on okay. Google to sell these famous camel boots. Thurl and his teams agreed with the American company. As a result, when you type these three words on the search engine, this is what happens. Vous voyez qu'on a tapé bot camel cuir et on apparaît tout en haut de la page ici. The website Brandali appears at the top of the list in a section reserved for advertising and it is indicated by a small orange banner. C'est essentiel d'être le premier ou en tout cas dans les premiers parce que Google c'est des, des dizaines de pages de, de, issues de la recherche mais en réalité les gens vont rarement plus loin que la première page. Donc c'est important d'être dans la première page et idéalement c'est important de remonter tout en haut. To obtain this enhancement, Cyril Andrino pays Google 40 cents each time you go to his website. After this process, the bill rises very quickly. For a single product, he buys dozens of different word combinations. You see bot camel, you see bot sans S, you see camel plus bot, uh, camel avec un S, bot sans S, you see bot couleur camel, bot avec un S, camel, bot sans S, camel sans S. Uh, bot avec un S, cavalière avec un S, enfin vous voyez qu'on peut uh, absolument uh, uh, tout acheter. Et pourquoi on n'achète pas simplement uh, bot, uh, camel, uh, cuir uh, Moi je veux que la personne qui tape avec un S nous trouve et celle qui tape sans S nous trouve aussi. Every year, his company buys around 150,000 words or word groups from Google for a total of nearly 2 million euros. In France only, the ad would pay every year more than one and a half billion euros to the American firm. For maximum ad benefits, in Ireland, a tax haven for European companies, that the multinational company charges the word combinations purchased by the French companies. A slate of hand that allows people to pay around 10 times less in taxes than it should in France. The giant company is insatiable Google is no longer satisfied with selling advertising to websites, and the giant is now attacking all businesses, even those on your street corner. In Bordeaux, the conquest has already begun. Emmanuel Rosset is the pilot. Her entire strategy is to pass this gift from the house, offered by Google. This young Google recruit offers small merchants a service that cannot be refused. Getting your store listed for free to appear on Google Maps with this little red symbol on the map. Just là, en fait. Today, she spotted a fish market. Her conquest operation starts with a bold move. Bonjour. With one simple question. Je sais pas si vous êtes déjà présent en ligne. Euh, moi, je suis présent chez moi, mais pas par rapport au biais de la société. D'accord. Donc la poissonnerie aujourd'hui euh, n'est pas présente sur Internet. Non, on a, on a juste, on avait un petit profil Facebook euh, il y a quelques temps, mais on n'a rien de, rien de plus. D'accord, très bien. Ce que je peux vous montrer, c'est comment faire ouais. pour. Euh, c'est complètement gratuit. Euh, être présent euh, sur le moteur de recherche et sur la carte Google Maps. Quand, uh, vos clients vous cherchent. A free service that can bring in new customers. In general, the argument is good and Emmanuel has something better. En plus, dans le cadre de cette opération, je suis accompagnée de Tristan, un photographe professionnel, qui vous propose gratuitement, voilà, qui vous propose gratuitement en fait de prendre des photos de votre établissement pour mettre encore plus en valeur. En avant la poissonnerie. Exactement. Professional photos taken here today will not cost him a cent. The shopkeeper is not going to be asked for long to pose in front of the camera. Voilà, donc ça à ça. Donc, for the technical part and the creation of the account, Emmanuel manages everything. On va en créer pour cet établissement-là pour que les gens du quartier aussi puissent vous trouver. In less than 20 minutes, she managed to convince the fishmonger. He will just have to validate the account to appear on Google Maps. Merci. Au revoir.
Visits like these, Emmanuel Rosset has been doing up to 15 a day. Est-ce que vous êtes déjà présent sur Internet Vous apparaissez très bien lorsqu'on vous cherche sur le moteur de recherche, mais pas sur la carte, donc c'est venir compléter cette visibilité. Est-ce que vous avez un compte Google ou un email que vous utilisez habituellement pour la boutique Une page en fait qui s'appelle Google My Business et qui vous permettra d'être dans, dans, dans la recherche et sur Google Maps. Bonne journée, merci. The young woman is not the only one preaching the good word. In France, there will soon be 200 like her going door to door for Google. It might be an expensive operation, but the company is looking ahead. Nous, ce qu'on espère, c'est que un maximum de PME euh, réussissent sur Internet et se développent et s'y plaisent. Et bien sûr, à terme, si ensuite les plus, euh, les plus matures euh, utilisent d'autres solutions, euh, c'est un vrai investissement. In marketing language, other solutions means advertising. Three weeks after our visit, all of the market traders received this letter, coming from Google to offer them an opportunity to buy advertising with a discount on the search engine to promote their business. In 2015, Emmanuel and her teams are planning to approach 200,000 merchants, so many new little red dots on the Google Maps and most importantly, new potential customers. Today, Google continues growing at the origin of its power, its search engine. In the United States, 7 out of 10 Americans use Google to find information online. In France, the number is 9 out of 10 in this case. Google has become the highway of our internet searches. Its domination is so big that the Californian firm is more and more tempted to abuse it to the detriment of some websites. Because Google now offers its own services in a lot of areas. It has its own flight comparator, Google Flights. Also, a price comparison site, Google Shopping. The search engine provides its weather report, and even videos, thanks to the YouTube platform which belongs to the company. All kinds of activities that are starting to suffocate some other companies. South of Paris, the headquarters of Easy Voyage, a flight and vacation comparing website on internet. Salut. A site launched 15 years ago by Jean-Pierre Nader. Did Sébastien uh, the planning? Uh, no, I haven't yet received. I'm going to go with him. Yeah, I'm going to go with him. It's like a knee. This loudmouth boss. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is inexhaustible when it comes to denouncing the hegemony of Google. To explain us the reasons for his anger, he offers us a demonstration in front of his computer. When he types Flight New York, for example, he finds his site very poorly placed in the results. Much lower than before on the screen and for him, it's a big deal. The difference between being exposed here and the emplacement where we are now is 30% of traffic in less. And the principal port of entry on the web, Google, has become our Principal concurrent. If his website is less well placed than before, is because Google prefers to put forward its own comparator. This is what appears for the search flight New York. The ads in orange are seen on a large part of the screen. To the right and up. In the middle, in the place where Easy Voyage appeared before, a large frame is inserted with flight proposals by Google. In fact, this is a site of Google, Google Flights. For the boss of Easy Voyage, this is an unfair competition. On est un peu dans la position d'un producteur donc d'eau gazeuse qui verrait donc Carrefour ou Leclerc produire le même produit que que le sien et cacher le produit donc originel derrière les rayons pour mettre en avant que le sien. Donc de plus en plus, on s'éloigne d'un moteur de recherche objectif, transparent au service donc de l'information pour aller vers une entreprise de marketing qui va utiliser tous les leviers à sa disposition pour produire de la richesse et gagner de l'argent. It ends up affecting his business. In two years, it has lost about 20 employees out of 150. He is not the only one who is suffering. A lot of European businesses are affected. Last November, 
The European Parliament has symbolically asked for the dismantling of Google to separate the search engine functions from the other existing commercial services. At the Giants' headquarters is the kind of threat that leaves David Drummond speechless. For the multinational company's lawyer, these new services, considered by some to be unfair competition, are above all, is a progress for its users. You know, originally Google was just about 10 blue links on a page, uh, and then you'd click on the link and you'd find your answer somewhere. We have the ability to provide the user with the direct answer, and if we can do that, we should do that, uh, because users uh, really want us to give you the answer. What, if you're interested in a flight, you should get, get the flight. You should get information about the flight. If you're interested in the weather, you should just get the weather uh, in, your, in your results, rather than having to click on another page and go someplace else. So this could be worse for the competitors who don't use the same functions. What about the users, us the Google holds so dearly? Are we really winning this case? A few miles from Los Angeles, closer to Hollywood Studios than to Silicon Valley, a man asked himself this question. Bonjour. Nice to meet you. John Simpson works for an American consumer advocacy organization, Consumer Watchdog. Our conference room, you know, I mean, um, when we have news conferences, we push the table back out of the way and pull the podium out. And, and this is our president, Jamie Court. In his office, this former journalist clearly shows his taste for provocation. Is it not shocking for an American to have, like, Lenin in his uh, office? Uh, sometimes the shock value is, well, something that works to your benefit. And, yeah. What John Simpson likes to shake up, it is mainly companies like Google, um, his pet pee for many years. Uh, where do I put it? <laughs> he has written several reports questioning the search engine. Yeah, I... In particular, this study dedicated to Google shopping Google's price comparison tool. The one that is systematically put forward by the engine when you are looking for a product. A camera, for example. The average consumer thinks that these are suggestions from Google Shopping that are based on price or something like that. So frequently a person will just click on that and you know go right to that thing and pay the price that's shown there. To find out if the Google Comparator offered the best prices, John Simpson did the test with 15 products. Blender, Toaster, or Lego. Each time, he compared the price offered by Google Shopping with that of other Comparators. What we found, I guess, was in eight, eight of the products, the comparison shopping engine the competitor that people were not really going to was a cheaper price than what you were getting for Google. So, and the differences ranged, I think one of them was 67% cheaper. With a poster, it was $49.95 on Google, we could find one for $29.95, so $20 uh, less. If the Google Comparator does not always offer the best price, that's because it works just like all the other Comparators online. Not many people know this, but these sites are not always objective. They live mostly on advertising. The same goes for the Google, which is paid by the merchant every time a product is clicked. There's a little note here, it doesn't say advertising, it says sponsored. And if you click on that, it opens up a little thing that says, some of the merchants whose, adver whose material, I'm paraphrasing, whose material is included uh, may have paid Google. Well, not some not may, all, and they did. That's the business model. You want to be in Google Shopping? You pay. But you the problem for John Simpson is trust that we all do have, implicitly for Google. In all areas, his biggest battle is personal data. So what do you, you've got... With colleagues, they are often invited to public events around the multinational company Google to draw attention to this issue. In a white tracksuit, signed by Google and big multicolored glasses on the nose, the small team indulges in a funny merry-go-round. 
which consists of walking behind people making strange gestures. A bit annoying in the long run, but that's just the point. We're trying to make the point that if you track people in the real world, it's, it's obnoxious, it's privacy invasive, it's creepy. And it's just business as usual on the internet. Behind the clownish methods is a legitimate question. What does the giant really know about us? Because Google isn't just a search engine by itself, it's also the Gmail Messenger, the YouTube video site, or even the Android operation system that runs eight out of 10 smartphones in the whole world. So many services that allow the company to collect user data that they can use without a problem or limit, for better or for worse. It's in San Francisco, a few kilometers from the headquarters of the Californian giant, that we have become aware of the extent of the data that Google could have on each and every one of us. This is enough to make you dizzy. Good morning. Every morning in the trendy Castro district, Philip Judy and his wife start their day with vegetable juice. C'est notre rituel. Ça soigne. <laughs> ça soigne, ça soigne. Bon, voilà. This Frenchman who has lived in the U.S. for seven years leads a healthy life and above all very connected. Le réflexe du matin, c'est d'aller voir toutes les informations, typiquement, ça c'est mes rendez-vous. Voilà. Expert in new technologies, he tests everything that is being done in the field. Right now, his new toy is Google Now, an application that has existed for more than two years and that gives him a lot of useful information. Donc Google Now, c'est là. Donc on voit euh, des éléments de calendrier qui sont quand même les éléments importants. Ensuite, on voit les anniversaires. Ensuite, il y a la météo, la bourse, des informations euh, sur euh, mes programmes préférés. Nothing very surprising so far, but the app can actually do much better. For example, it knows how long ago he did not go to the supermarket. Visiblement, euh, Google est connecté à mon frigidaire parce qu'il me dit je dois aller à Rainbow Grocery, c'est là où on va faire nos courses. Et je ne sais pas pourquoi, mais ça m'explique que je vais mettre 30 minutes à pied pour aller là-bas. Peut-être qu'il estime euh, que je dois, je dois effectivement aller acheter des choses. Ce qui est vrai, ce qui est vrai, c'est incroyable. Ah tiens, voilà, à partir à 12h15. Effectivement, j'ai rendez-vous cet après-midi, donc euh, samedi quand je dois partir. Le temps, euh, comment est la circulation et... C'est comme un secrétaire particulier, en fait. Ben, en fait, on a besoin, des gens comme moi ont besoin d'avoir une secrétaire, une assistante, mais n'ont pas forcément les moyens. Donc, euh, ben, Google t'en offre une, en quelque sorte. Je ne paye même pas pour ça, ce qui est assez incroyable. It never ah. stops. Google now is like a second ah. wife in Philip's life. Philippe, Google Now ne vous avait pas dit de prendre votre parapluie Non, Google Now, si, Google Now m'a dit qu'il pleuvait. La météo de Google m'a informé que je devais prendre mon parapluie. Et ma femme m'a dit que je devais ouvrir mon parapluie. Donc entre ma femme et Google, je suis safe. Rien ne peut m'arriver. As soon as he leaves home, Google Now tracks him and anticipates his trips. So, what do I do? Philip has nothing to ask. At the moment, Google is offering him, for example, the quickest route to work. It tells him which tram line to take and the time at which he is supposed to arrive, exactly at 11.35 a.m. He knows que I work, he knows where I work, and he knows where I live. So, of course, he suggests. Each time, it's pretty accurate. Where are you It's here. 11h32. Impeccable, on a three minutes d'avance. Okay, il avait raison. How can this application by Google know so much about him, about his travels, the address of the stores he visits, 
friends' birthdays, or his favorite programs. The answer is given by the main concern who gives it to us, thanks to a computer and Google account. Je mets mon mot de passe. This account includes all the products that he uses at Google. And for each one of applications he uses, the amount of personal data collected is very impressive. First of all, there is the history of all these searches. Bah, ça donne en fait toutes les requêtes que j'ai pu faire sur Google. Typiquement, euh, voilà, euh, euh, quelle est la température à Paris faite à 11h26. The archives go back to 2007 when Philip created his Gmail account. On March 30 of that year, for example, he made a search on Google about Tony Parker at exactly 11:08. Et puis j'ai commencé à m'en servir. Il y a tout, 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 tout. A total of 53,043 requests exactly. There is something even better. Google is also Gmail, which stored all 40,232 emails from Philip. Not to mention YouTube and its 213 archived videos. Above all, Google is present in Philip's phone, thanks to the Android system. This allows it to have access to his contacts, 11,849 people saved, but also to thousands of photos and phone calls, and even the voice messages left on, his answering machine. Hey, PJ, this is David. I wanted to... If you want, you can absolutely know everything about your movements, thanks to GPS. Je suis allé sur la 280, c'est l'autoroute du bas, sur la 101, l'autoroute du haut. Et effectivement, la semaine dernière, j'ai été, j'avais une vingtaine de rendez-vous programmés dans différentes sociétés. Donc voilà, on voit le, on voit le travail. It is by crossing all these very personal boundaries about your information that a service like Google Now can actually work. However, this mass of mind-blowing data stored on the servers of the Californian company is mainly for them an incredible financial windfall. Google euh, utilise des informations qui sont contextuelles, les emails que j'écris, les vidéos que je regarde, pour me servir de la publicité qui, par ailleurs, est payée par des sociétés qui veulent atteindre des gens comme moi. For Philip, this is part of the rules of the game, the consideration for the services offered by Google. He accepted it. However, are we all aware of it? And most importantly, are these practices legal? At what cost did the internet giant become the biggest vacuum cleaner to the world's personal data? The answers to these questions are at the headquarters of the CNIL, the National Commission for Information Technology and Liberties. They are responsible for protecting our data on the internet. You have to look for them first. A little over a year ago, the authority presided over by Isabel Falk Pierotin judged certain practices of the American company when it comes to personal data. Simply illegal. In its sanction, the CNIL questions the giant's privacy policy rules that we often agree quickly when you create an account with Google. This nine-page document, with links, annexes, technical terms that are a bit barbaric, and when you agree, you authorize the company to collect information about the services that you use. A vague formula that goes unnoticed in the flow of information to digest, but which allows Google to go a long way in accessing and collecting your data. If you have a Gmail account, for example, this formula allows Google to analyze the content of your emails, the ones you send, yes, but even also the ones you get. The objective, you are sent targeted advertising. C'est quand même euh, un dispositif qui consiste à ce que euh, le facteur euh, ouvre les lettres et euh, en fonction des lettres, euh, vous met en plus un prospectus commercial dans votre boîte aux lettres. 
Donc, euh, je pense qu'on est sur un dispositif qui, euh, quand même, est assez délicat. However, it's not just that. In the document, when you agree, it also says that when you delete your account and therefore your data, Google does not immediately delete copies from its servers. Il peut arriver que, euh, à la demande d'un utilisateur, son compte soit effectivement supprimé. Donc, facialement, on croit que la donnée n'existe plus, mais pour autant, il peut arriver, et en tout cas, on n'a pas d'engagement de la part de Google, que la donnée demeure sur les serveurs de Google et dans l'écosystème de Google. Et c'est justement un des points sur lequel on voudrait des engagements précis de Google, en disant, au-delà de cette durée, il n'y a plus de données. For how long exactly is our data stored on Google servers after they've been removed? We did a test by deleting a Gmail account. After three weeks, oddly enough, we reactivate the account without any problems. Surprisingly, our emails and contacts have been kept intact throughout this time. According to the company, this would be in the interest of the user who would like to find this information, but according to them, everything would disappear after a maximum of six months. In the documents that we went through, no commitments of this kind were found. The president of the CNIL is still waiting for an answer. However, its means of pressure are light. For deficiencies found, Google was only fined 150,000 euros in France, the maximum allowed by law. A crumb for the firm. This vagueness around personal data has already started to tarnish the company's reputation. One of the risks involved is data piracy, as proved by a resounding scandal. Two years ago, computer scientist Edward Snowden revealed that the NSA, the American intelligence agency that he worked for, collected private information via several websites, which also included Google. Enough to transform fascination into anxiety. What does Google actually have in store for us? A better world or a more threatening one? A question that arises in view of the crazy ambitions of its two founders. Over the past few years, not a month goes by without the announcement of a new futuristic project signed by Google. Google introduces its new self-driving car prototype to the world today. The tech giant is developing airborne drones capable of flying on their own. They would deliver anything from candy to medicine. The company is also working on pills that are supposed to detect cancer or contact lenses for diabetics. It would even be working on immortality at the heart of this excessive ambition, the very discreet Larry Page, who refuses to impose any limits on himself. It's important to start now. It's important to do things that you think are crazy. If you're really spending all of your time on incremental evolution, you're probably doing the wrong thing. It's probably always good to take like 20% of your time, you know, focus on the things that seem crazy and far out. And in our experience, those things have turned out to be pretty important. To invent our future, the founding CEO of the company is not content to invest billions in research every year. He has developed novel working methods to push his teams to go even further. Every engineer, for example, is encouraged to devote 20% of their time to the projects of their choice. That's how David Coe has created these famous glasses. C'est nous-mêmes qui gérons notre temps, c'est-à-dire qu'on peut faire euh, une journée par semaine ou euh, deux jours euh, tous les deux semaines ou euh, trois jours euh, par mois. One of the company's flagships, Gmail Mail has started like that. Just like Google Now, the personal assistant who knows everything about you. Being creative is an obsession here at Google to encourage its employees to constantly use their imagination. The company even created a place specifically for that. 
And now, uh, welcome to the garage. At Google, we call this place the garage in homage to the founders, from the beginning, where it all started. The place was designed as a temple of creativity. There are computers, of course, but not just that. We have random materials from like wire to just Play-Doh, you know, Lego, so even like, you know, sewing machines. So here's a 3D printer. There are also do-it-yourself tools, like in a giant handcraft workshop, with the added bonus of the same music as in a nightclub. If you want to create a, an environment where wild ideas are born, music is part of that experience as well. So if you have like upbeat music and like really loud music, you know, people get into a specific mindset. They want to get active, they want to have a bias towards action, they want to move around, they want to build something. And so it's really helping them to get active as well. To stimulate the imagination of employees, the company has even planned training courses. And like, sort of like, the, what is the gut feeling? On that day, it's a group in the human resources department that does it. What exactly are they doing? Invent a new product on the theme of vacations, thanks to the advice of two in-house animators. We shoot big, we shoot for the moon, like 10x, so even if it might not be like physically uh, feasible at the moment, it's really about like the brainstorming, brainstorming uh, idea and the, uh, the effect of that. What these employees learn here above all is to go from an idea to a prototype to create a concrete object. There are tons and tons and tons of buckets where there's markers, pens, paper, uh, all kinds of really crazy stuff for you to prototype with. So the, the sky is like really the limit on how it is that you want to prototype. Go about 20 minutes. The crazier the better. So go. Each group must put their project into shape to present it to all participants at the end of the course. We're done. Okay. It's like kindergarten, it goes a bit in all directions. We're making bracelets as our prototype. a virtual hologram that will project and act as your own personalized tour guide for wherever you are. Um, so right now we're just kind of making the bracelets to show that. <laughs> Part of our idea is um, the idea that you can take a vacation that involves like an unhuman experience. So one of our ideas was you can take a vacation where you could view the world like from a bird's point of view. So I'm making a bird. After 20 minutes, it's the high oral exam. So we thought of a holograph or a hologram um, that could be projected from like a bracelet <laughs> or a watch or a ring or, Both. you know, it could be incorporated as a glass. But basically this idea of a hologram that would be your travel friend. So if Amy Coos knows that you don't like crowds and Times Square is super crowded at the moment, <laughs> Amy Coos is going to tell you not to go to Times Square. Always have to ask things of Amy Coos or will he, she just kind of like pop up with suggestions every once in a while or is it a mix of both? I think it could definitely be a mix of both. Um, if you're it, feeling lonely, it'll just jump right in and say like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Um, I think it could like recommend like restaurants for you to you know try well, or you're hungry. yeah read your blood sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Here they don't forbid themselves anything and are not afraid of the absurdity. Say you want to relive a past experience, it will go and kind of you can you have these yeah. things where you can feel your vacation <laughs> or smell it and see it and relive it. As well. <laughs> It may seem a bit smoky like that, but at Google, it's serious. The training is even based on statistics. Prototyping is perhaps one of the most important part of the exercise here because we're gonna realize very quickly that, hey, this doesn't work. So let's move to the next thing. So we don't waste time on something that potentially could not be a solution for our client. And then the success is higher. The garage, it's the Care Bear version of creativity with a Google sauce. Because this whole thing is about innovation. There is infinitely more secret places and things for the company. Uh, yeah.
This building, which is prohibited to enter with cameras, is Google's actual think tank for new ideas. It's called Google X. It is a very strategic service managed in person by Sergey Brin, one of the two founders. They work there on the company's craziest projects. These balloons, for example, which allow access to the internet in the most remote areas of the world, but also contact lenses for diabetics capable of measuring blood glucose levels in the body. Or the famous Google Glass augmented reality glasses launched three years ago and sold for $1,500 a pair. Obviously too expensive to convince the general public, Google has announced that they will stop producing them for now. The company is betting heavily on another innovation that could end up revolutionizing our lives. A car that drives by itself. There's no steering wheel in the way. <laughs> in this promotional video, it is presented by Google as the miracle solution for the elderly and the disabled, which also includes the blind. I love this. <laughs> the most impressive, because this car is not only restricted to closed circuits. In the streets near the American headquarters on public roads, it is not uncommon to see this kind of white car with a small turret on the roof. A more powerful version of the self-driving car. Hi. Hello. This is Sondrine. Hello. For official presentations, we have an appointment with Priscilla Anox. She is part of the team working on the project. So you're working at Google X? Yes. Yes. And Jared does as well. Um, and we uh, drive and test out the cars. A car that is quite classic in appearance, but equipped with sensors everywhere. The laser that's spinning on top, it can see. The laser has a range of about 60 to 70 meters around the whole car. And then up here is the radar that's mounted on the front. Uh, it has a range of about 200 meters. And it can see uh, cars up in front of it. Um, so not just, we're usually not just paying attention to the car that's directly in front of us. We pay attention to the cars that are three cars in front of us. These radars sort of help see around us and try, sort of they're trying to get into our um, like blind spots that we might not pick up from the radar. And then inside the car, uh, we'll just, there's an on and off button and then really that's the only major difference between uh, a regular Lexus and a self-driving Lexus. It is prohibited to enter with our camera. However, inside on these Google images, you can see that the car is driving by itself with no one touching the steering wheel. It is capable of interpreting signals sent by radars to anticipate all the dangers of the road. For example, this cyclist who appears in red on the software. This car worthy of a science fiction movie, the company hopes to commercialize it within five years. Beyond the enchanted revolution promised in this video, why is the internet giant interested in this market? How can it hope to make its huge investments profitable? Some like Frank Cazenave have their little idea. This automotive specialist, who works for a German equipment manufacturer, wrote a book on the subject called Stop Google. This car without a driver fascinates him. However, Google's ambitions scare him away. The company would have other goals that are less generous than it claims. According to him, it would be a way to find out even more about us. La voiture autonome, c'est pour Google le moyen de sortir du monde d'Internet et pour être en prise avec le monde réel et pour continuer à constituer ses profils sur les individus. Puisque avec la voiture sans chauffeur, Google saura où est-ce que vous allez, où est-ce que vous, vous consommez et ce que vous consommez dans quel lieu. Perhaps more disturbing, thanks to its car, Google could practically dictate our choices to us. 
Google, demain, avec Google Maps, qui sera dans, dans le véhicule sans chauffeur, euh, pourra vous faire des propositions de consommation pour aller au cinéma, pour aller acheter euh, une paire de, de baskets. Et donc, il vous amènera dans un magasin qui sera référencé sur Google Maps. La Google Car vous amène directement dans ce magasin. Et lorsque vous payez euh, vos chaussures, dans le prix de vente, euh, il y aura une partie qui reviendra à Google pour vous avoir amené dans ce lieu de consommation. Enough to raise even more advertising revenue. For now, it is just a hypothesis, but let's say that's one of the goals of this car, and it will happen one day. Imagine what your life could be like in a few years or even a few months with the innovations that Google promises us. We played our part. Like every morning, the Google car you ordered is waiting for you down the street from your house. Barely inside, your Android phone is spotted by the car. Here is a selection of shows you might like on YouTube. Do not forget to respond to these two emails before 10 a.m. There are a few traffic jams, but no stress. Google Maps optimizes the trip. You will have arrived in time for your 8.30 a.m. meeting. At the end of the day, your phone reminds you that tomorrow is your son's birthday. You don't have any ideas, but Google analyzed their latest searches. He should like this pair of shoes. You're safe. There is a store on the way that actually sells them. When you walk through the door, the saleswoman is already waiting with a pair of shoes in hand, in the right size, obviously. Like you pay with a Google Wallet. You get a 25% discount on your favorite perfume in the shop across the street. When you get home, your robot welcomes you like every evening with a large glass of well-iced tea the way you like it. For dinner, you could order sushi. You haven't had any in exactly 16 days. It even prepares a menu for you based on your preferences that it knows well. 10 minutes later, a drone delivers your meal to your home. Perfect. A light dinner. You need this, according to your Android bracelet, which monitors your weight, but it is worried about your lack of sleep lately. Your Google coach looks after you day and night. Isn't life beautiful?